Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Bradley Lawrence, a Senior Technical Service Manager at Novus International. So Bradley, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Oh, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I have a master's and doctorate's <clears throat> degrees from Purdue University in monogastric nutrition. My uh, area of expertise was uh, lysing the energy ratios in the master's program and then modeling development of gastric ulcers in my uh, PhD program. Then I went to work in the feed industry for a number of years, spent a little time at Beringer Ingelheim. Uh, supporting Denegard and the enterosol ileitis vaccine. And then I moved to Novus about 16 and a half years ago. And as you uh, kind of included there in the introduction, I'm the senior technical manager for the North American pork team. Gotcha. So I understand Novus has put quite a bit of money towards and spent a good amount of time researching the benefits of copper and swine diets. And also looking at things like things you might not have considered when supplementing and how it works in the pig's body. So I guess to start us off, would you mind telling us a little bit about what all you've learned from that research? Yeah, so really what we want to talk about in this podcast is challenging some of the traditional paradigms that uh, that we've had about copper supplementation generally. Let's take, for example, that you know copper's primary role is antimicrobial. We want that to uh, we want that inorganic copper moving through the GI tract, and it's that antimicrobial role. Um, and so there's mode of action questions that we're challenging. Um, another paradigm shift is, well, I'm using copper in, in grow finish during the summertime because I'm trying to get average daily gain. That's another uh, common paradigm as well as, well, I only use copper partway through the grow finish. Um, so those are some of the really, it's, it's less about what product we're using as it is about challenging some of those uh, paradigms. So before we started recording, we talked a little bit about some of those different ways of how you can use copper and how it benefits pigs and specifically looking at inorganic supplementation versus what has become a bit more popular lately, um, organic supplementation with those amino acid chelates. Um, so what would you say when using the organic sources that you've learned that you might not have considered before in terms of how they function in the pig? Oh, great points to bring up. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, the big thing with the, and I'm going to use the methionine hydroxy analog chelates, the market knows it as the Mentrex uh, copper molecule. Uh, what we've learned over time is that in the nursery pig, as we all know, that nursery pig is very responsive to copper source. And actually the growth curves look different if you're feeding similar doses of the methionine hydroxy analog chelate copper versus inorganics. At the same dose, you'll get better feed conversion, better average daily gain, which tells us that that nursery pig is really looking for copper. It, it needs it for physiological functions. Now, when we move to the grow finish pig, what the data tells us is, is that there's a max on how much um, copper in that organic form uh, that is needed. Um, so our traditional levels, you know, we started out 40 years ago with 250 part per million of copper is copper sulfate. Over time, we moved to 150 ppm as, of copper as a tribasic copper chloride type molecule. Uh, with the methionine hydroxy analog chelate, it's showing us that we can get by with just 50 uh, ppm. Now that really gets to a couple of things. One is that paradigm about we need that copper in the inorganic form moving through the GI tract. When we drop down to only 50 ppm of copper in that methionine hydroxy analog chelate form compared to 150 or more of inorganic, we've got a lot less copper that's gonna be making its way through the GI tract. So it's not just that copper in the GI tract that's given us the mode of action. It's that actually getting that copper into that pig, fit supporting the physiological functions. Copper is more than just a pretty face. It's more than the antimicrobial activity. It's, it's involved in a lot of physiological processes, everything from the immune system to structural development. Um, so it, there's a lot of roles uh, that it really plays. 
The other thing that we're learning is that nutrient availability is different when you feed only 50 ppm of copper as the, that methionine hydroxy analog chelate. Um, nitrogen retention is improved. Calcium phosphorus availabilities improve. Manganese and zinc uh, retention is improved compared to feeding uh, inorganic sources of copper. So there's a lot of physiological benefits that uh, we believe are really giving that ability to get more performance, get better feed efficiency uh, with using even less copper than we have traditionally. Gotcha. So I know with typical copper supplementation, it tends to slow down the um, phosphorus and calcium absorption. Um, and with that methionine chelate, is that because you use less copper overall or is it due to the structure of the organic source? So we've done some work looking at the interaction of trace mineral source uh, by phytase. And what the data would kind of indicate is that we as nutritionists have probably underestimated the impact of those inorganic trace minerals on the strength of that phytate molecule. In other words, if you want your phytase to work better, take the sulfates, the inorganic trace minerals out, use the methionine hydroxy analog chelate. It's allowing that phytase to work better. And we believe it's that improvement in, in phytase efficacy that is allowing for that improvement in calcium and phosphorus uh, availability. And it's, it's three to four percentage points uh, improvement in calcium and phosphorus retention simply by changing the copper source. Also, while we're talking about the source there, and yes, it sounds like there's a lot more things to consider other than antimicrobial activity. But with the antimicrobial activity, do you think there is a different response from the pathogens when using an organic source versus an inorganic source? Uh, from what we have seen today, it's hard to say that there's, you know, definitively um, differences in source at the same level of inclusion on those potential pathogens. Where it becomes more important to think about that is, number one, can we use less? Because a lot of your uh, potential pathogens like E. coli, which is a major industry issue, they carry genes for both zinc and also copper resistance. And a lot of those zinc and copper resistance genes are also tied to antimicrobial resistance genes. And so if we can keep the amount of total copper down by using a more available source, one that's going to give us better feed conversion anyway, uh, we're going to have some long-term benefits on hopefully uh, maintaining efficacy of not only copper, but also of our uh, antimicrobials that we have in the toolbox. Gotcha. And then one other question I had. So with this boost that you have with the immunity and cellular function and the physiological effects of copper absorption, do you think that it's still more beneficial in the nursery period due to that typical antimicrobial effect that we feed it for? Or do you think there's also an equal opportunity for use in the grow finish period? Well, the key in the, in the grow finish, again, is around some of those paradigms we have. A lot of people will, again, they'll say, well, I'm going to use copper during the summer for the increased gain. I want to dispel something. We actually see in our studies, we see a, have a hard time seeing a gain response to any copper source. It's mostly a feed conversion response. Then the other side of that is that overlooks the wintertime. We shut barns up. We start having more incidents of our more respiratory type challenges. We were fortunate, fortunate several years ago <clears throat> to have a set of research pigs that they got into late finishing and they broke with a combination of PERS and influenza together. The pigs that had never seen copper during their entire feeding period from wean out into the grow finish, they really suffered from an average daily gain and feed conversion standpoint. Those pigs that had, um, had seen copper supplementation all the way through until that hit about a hundred and it's about 145 days into the wean to finish cycle. Those pigs that had seen copper really benefited. Um, like <laughs> difference between five points of or a 5.3 uh, 
uh, feed to gain compared to, you know, maybe a four feed to gain. It was, it was a big difference. Um, the pigs that had not seen copper in grow finish during that phase, their gains were less than a pound a day. The ones that did see copper, their gains were well over a pound a day. They still got hit, but not to the same degree as those pigs. So copper is important in those viral challenges. We hit those really bad viral challenges in late finish. It costs a lot of money. Don't overlook copper supplementation in grow finish, particularly if you have some of those significant viral challenges. Gotcha. And that study that you just mentioned, that was during the winter then? That was during the winter months. And that's the other paradigm shift. I just feed copper during the summer. Our studies, we've got about 14 of them now. They have covered all seasons of the year just because that's when you get time to get into somebody's facilities. We've seen a benefit of Mentrex copper versus other copper sources um, during all periods of the year. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus's products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well-being in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. For more information, visit Novus's website at www.novusint.com. Gotcha. And then I guess final question for you. So in terms of research that you're currently doing or plan to do in the future, what do you guys plan to look for when running those studies? Oh, great, great question. And one of the interesting observations that we have seen is differences in um, percent removals. Now, that's in a research setting. We've got to take that and look at it uh, from turn that into percent of pigs that are reaching primary market. We're seeing some differences in copper sources uh, in the percent of pigs that will reach primary market. That has a significant economic impact. Uh, but we've got to get to where we're looking at 50, 60, 100,000 pig type trials to really understand, um, you know, statistically, what does that mean? But that's the next area that we want to unlock is what is the role of copper, not only on performance, but on survival and how many full value pigs, um, using the terminology of the industry, um, that uh, you can get. Well, I believe that's all we have time for. So thank you again for coming on the show and sharing all this experience with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, Feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Mm-hmm.